Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jimmy, I am part of the Chaos Group team and uh, I want to thank everyone first of all for inviting us, uh, especially the University of Podava, Matniu and our partner Zen. Uh, today I want to spend some time talking about uh, the latest things that we have in V-Ray for Rhino and I'm going to show you different features that I think you will find very very useful. So I'm going to stop the camera now and move to my screen. Uh, can everyone see my screen now? Okay. So, uh, the first thing I'm going to start with uh, is called V-Ray RT. Uh, it is a brand new addition to V-Ray and it will uh, help you very much in your uh, when you're setting up materials or lighting. So, one of the biggest issues uh, when you have to set up, for example, your shaders is that uh, every time you change something, you have to go hit render, wait for several seconds and then you see the rendering. But V-Ray RT works completely differently and allows you to save much time when you're uh, setting up the shaders. So, uh, before I start, however, I want to show you how you can activate it because it's a little bit uh, different from ev everything else. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is you need to find the installation folder of V-Ray and start this uh, application that is called Distributed Rendering. So I'm going to start it and uh, it is this uh, black uh, command line that you see here. And then you need to change some settings of V-Ray. Uh, first, you need to go to System and make sure that Distributed Rendering is enabled. So this checkbox is checked. And then you can add hosts. So V-Ray RT can work with several machines in your network, so it can be very fast this way. Right now, I'm just using uh, a local host, which is my, my own machine. So I'm going to uh, just leave it there. And then uh, I need to go to RT Engine and enable the V-Ray RT. So what happens now is when I hit render, uh, V-Ray RT is going to start and um, it will take several seconds to transfer the geometry into the scene. And you can see that uh, as I change something in the scene, I immediately see the result of my actions. And uh, this is going to be very useful when I want to set up the lighting of the scene, when I want to set up the shaders. So uh, for example, if I want to set up this red shader here, I'll open uh, the material editor and find the material for this uh, particular part and start playing with it. And uh, as I change the color, you'll see that uh, this immediately will refresh here. So this will be very useful when you have to select the perfect color or the perfect light position or anything like that, especially when you have clients which are very picky. So you can have the client sit next to you and he can be guiding you uh, and you can very easily finish the shading um, in a couple of hours instead of in a couple of days especially in a more complex uh, scenario. So uh, another thing that is very important about V-Ray is that uh, it will create uh, V-Ray RT is going to create exactly the same image as the standard V-Ray. So if you're changing, uh, if you're applying materials or lights and then you just want to render out an animation, you can be 100% sure that V-Ray RT is going to create exactly the same image. So you don't have to readjust all the materials or all the lighting for the production rendering. Uh, another very cool thing is that as you can see, uh, if I move the camera, uh, you see this very rough image and then uh, the image constantly improves. So this is because uh, V-Ray uh, works in this progressive, progressive path tracing mode, which means that it is constantly rendering. If I leave it for 5 hours, it is going to render 5 hours. If I leave it for as long as I leave it, it is going to render and it is going to improve the quality of my image. So at any point, for example, if I'm new to V-Ray and I'm not entirely sure what settings to use to create a good quality image, I can just start V-Ray RT, hit render, and then wait until I'm happy with the uh, image that I see. So, for example, if I like this image right now, I can click save and save it at any point. So this is a very uh, nice and very powerful addition to your uh, arsenal of tools that is going to make uh, shading and lighting uh, much faster and easier for you. And it's also going to help you in these cases when you're not entirely familiar with V-Ray. So it's going to make it easy for you to learn the different settings of V-Ray and get uh, nice quality images. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move on to the next thing. And uh, in the next scene, I want to talk a little bit about shading. So uh, I have a very simple example here, just uh, two diamonds. Uh, but uh, the thing about them is that they are uh, very refractive, so I get uh, this image. And uh, if I want to make this look realistic, I really need to have many bounces of light, many bounces of refracted light. Uh, but the problem is that this image still doesn't look um, too good. It looks a little bit flat and uh, it doesn't look realistic. 
Uh, the reason for this is uh, is because you uh, intuitively know how this image should look and it should have some color in it because uh, in physics when light passes through object like this, a refractive object, the light is dispersed into its basic, uh, basic component. So you see different wavelengths and you see different colors. And uh, with the latest service pack of V-Ray we can actually um, simulate this effect very easily. So if I bring out the material editor, you can see that this is my diamond material here. And this material is just a simple refractive material. Uh, but right here, uh, we have several new settings. And the most important is this one that says dispersion. Where I can just click this checkbox. And now if I hit render, we're going to see those uh, colorful dispersed light. And uh, this will be very useful for you, especially if you need to create close-ups of jewelry or other refractive uh, objects and materials. Uh, this will add a lot of realism. And uh, just to prove a point, uh, I will now use caustics. So I'm going to bring the options of V-Ray and enable the caustics. And you'll see that uh, this uh, dispersed can only also cover our caustics uh, refractions. So we'll give it a couple of seconds. And uh, right now I'm using very low settings for the caustics. That's why they look uh, so blurry. But you can see that uh, we get even colors in the uh, in the caustics refractions. And once again, as I told you, if you have to render some jewelry or something that's uh, different uh, glassy objects, uh, you can create really nice images using this simple checkbox. Uh, something else about shading that we added. Uh, I'm going to open my next scene. Uh, and in this scene, uh, we're dealing with uh, reflective materials, especially in my case, I'm working with something that uh, should simulate uh, a metallic surface. And uh, one of the uh, few things that we were not able to do in the past is to simulate uh, is to simulate um, a refractive surface that is also brushed. So uh, we could stretch the highlights, but we were not able to create uh, patterns or anything like that. So if you take a look at this image now, you see that uh, I have this metallic cover here, but the, the metal has been brushed and the brush left some uh, pattern on top of it. And uh, I'm going to show in a second how you can do this. I just want to wait for this to clear out so you can see the result. Now, uh, let's see the material for this object. Uh, you see that we just have one reflective material. You see we have some texture in the reflection so that it, the reflection varies a little bit. And then I have set the highlight and the reflection glossiness to 0 0.7. So this makes uh, this uh, blurry reflection. And then we also use some anisotropy. So the anisotropy is set to 0 0.8, which means that we're stretching the highlights in a certain direction. Uh, but uh, in previous version, we are not able to uh, use this rotation with the texture. But right now, I have actually uh, placed a map in my uh, rotation field here. And uh, you can see the texture that I'm using. So with this texture, I'm using the grayscale values to rotate the highlights in different direction, which creates this nice result that you see here. And once again, this will be very useful for particular close-ups or if you want to create a product that uh, has this brushed metal and you want to leave some pattern there, uh, you can use this uh, simple addition to V-Ray. So this is uh, about shading. I want to show you a little bit about um, lighting and stuff like that. So in here I have a very simple example. Uh, what I want to create is a simple clay render. So um, I have this object in the middle that has uh, this uh, uh, light gray material and uh, I want to illuminate it from all directions equally. So to do that, what I, I have done is uh, I have these options here for environment where I can say that uh, there is a white environment, uh, just white color in my environment. And then when I hit render, you see this pre-pass that happens. This is global illumination. So right now I'm using global illumination to hit the environment which is perfectly white and get this even uh, evenly distributed uh, white rendering. However, uh, because the settings of the GI are very low, what we see here is that we don't get nice contact shadows. There are no shadows here. And also, uh, we lose some of the detail over here where we have the edges. And uh, if I want to achieve this just with global illumination, it will require that I use very, very high settings. And uh, the rendering could be very slow, so I don't want to do this. Instead, uh, I'm going to bring out the settings of uh, the global illumination. And you see that we now have this set of options that says ambient occlusion. So if I just enable the ambient occlusion and hit render, you'll see a very big difference uh, 
between this the previous image and the new one. As you can see, what we get now is uh, a nice dark edge here where we had uh, the objects close together. We also get nice contact shadows, and you see that we will have a shadow over here. So what the ambient occlusion pass does is uh, it's very simple. It just uh, darkens the areas of the image where objects are close together and leaves areas of the image where there are no objects close together. It leaves those areas white. But as a whole, it's a simple method of uh, adding this nice detail to our rendering. And you can see that the image looks much better right now and much uh, more realistic. And the settings of the ambient occlusion are pretty uh, simple. Uh, you just have this checkbox to enable them. You have subdivisions to control the noise, so if you get a noisy result, you will increase those. And then you have a radius that specifies uh, the, the length of those shadows that we saw there. So uh, how far away from the objects we are going to see shadows. And you also have this amount, which is basically a multiplier, and you can use it to make this effect more or less apparent. Now, this was a simple example of fighting, and I want to show you now a little bit more complex approach. And I'm sure that at some point, uh, maybe you have to use this. Okay, I have exactly the same scene, but this time, instead of using this simple white color in the environment, uh, I have used the texture. And the texture is a very complex one. Uh, let me show the texture. It is this uh, high dynamic range image that you've probably seen before. And the issue here is that uh, in the environment we have a very big variance of colors. We have parts of the image that are very, very, very bright, and other parts are uh, completely dark or black. And uh, once again, the only way to uh, illuminate the scene with this texture is to use global illumination. And the problem is that the global illumination has to have really high settings in order to be able to make sense of this texture. Otherwise, uh, if you use low settings like me right now, you get this very, very splotchy and terrible result. Uh, I can improve this you know, by increasing the settings of my global illumination solution. Uh, but uh, this is going to make the rendering much, much slower. So, and it's also going to blur all these uh, uh, shadows here. So, I see a nice shadow here, but if I increase the settings, this shadow is going to be gone. So, instead of using this approach, we can use uh, something that's called a V-Ray Dome White. It's this one here that you see. I have already created one Dome White. I'm going to enable it. And the Dome White is a, just a direct light that you can put a texture on. So, I have uh, placed the same texture. As you can see, this is the same... Uh, texture that I use in my environment. And right now, when I hit render, what is going to happen is very uh, will know that I want to use this texture for the illumination. So it's going to run a test on the texture. It's going to find the bright spots in my texture, and then it's going to shoot direct light from those bright areas. And what you get as a result is that uh, we'll create a much better image, much faster than if just using global illumination. So right now the rendering is slower, but this is because uh, the previous settings for the global illuminations were very low. If I want to create uh, this high quality image with just GI, uh, it would be nearly impossible. So as you can see, this is a pretty cool result, and you can see those nice uh, sharp shadows that we get from the bright areas in the in the texture. Now, especially for people that deal with product design, this will be uh, extremely useful. Uh, because I think you often need uh, uh, high dynamic range images to illuminate your scenes and setting up the global illumination can be a little bit uh, difficult in th those cases. So uh, the dome white is going to speed up your overflows uh, quite a bit. Okay, uh, my next scene is a little bit more interesting. Uh, it's a very simple scene, I just have uh, three lights here and a couple of um, uh, metallic bars in front of them. Uh, but if I bring the frame buffer and uh, enable the settings for the lens effect, uh, when I do this, V-Ray is going to know that I want to render this image, but uh, I want to render it in such a way that I want to be able to apply uh, V-Ray lens effects on them. So we're going to give it a couple of seconds to render it out. And then we can apply those uh, boom and glare effects. So a cool thing is that those effects can be uh, applied without having to pre-render the image. You just need to make sure that uh, the effects are enabled the first time you render it. And from then on, you can very uh, quickly uh, change the different um, 
lens uh, effects. For example, right now we're working with boom. I can also enable the glare and uh, give it uh, just change the setting from camera. So we use those controls here to control the glare. And you can see that uh, we immediately are applying those uh, uh, boom, and, boom and glare effects. Now the reason we're able to do this in the frame buffer is because the V-Ray frame buffer uh, stores the information in this uh, floating point format and we have a high dynamic range of information inside, inside this uh, uh, frame buffer so we can use this information and wherever we get those bright areas we can uh, apply either the glare or the uh, boom effects so uh, once again uh, this will be useful if you have um, if you have to render something like the headlights of a car for example or if uh, you're, you have something that's very reflective and you're illuminating it uh, with a bright light and you get those uh, camera glare and boom effects, uh, this will add a lot of realism uh, to your scenes. Uh, I just want to know something. Uh, we have until... Uh, we have eight more minutes, right? Okay. Okay, so, so that I know how, how, uh, in how much detail to go while explaining whatever I have. Okay, uh, we're not going to talk anymore about lighting or shading. Uh, I just want to talk about something that is called uh, dynamic geometry in V-Ray. So, uh, you can see in this scene I have a very simple geometry, just this engine. And uh, I'm going to render it very quickly. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that this uh, uh, part of the engine here, the shiny part, looks a little bit more interesting. So, one way to do it, this is to use uh, displacement mapping. So let's bring out the material editor and this is the material that I have applied to this object here. So I have this material and uh, I'm going to enable the displacement and you'll see that for displacement I am using a texture. Uh, let me show this texture. Okay, so this is the texture that I'm using for the displacement. And I want what I want to create is just add this grid structure to those areas. Uh, what I want you to note now that when I start the rendering is that uh, V-Ray starts immediately rendering the displaced geometry. Uh, most rendering engines, they have to make some sort of a pre-pass to create the geometry, something like that. Uh, V-Ray works completely differently. Uh, it creates the displaced geometry on the fly. So whatever, whenever I'm rendering displaced geometry, V-Ray is generating it. And it's also generating it only for those small squares that you see being rendered. So this means that uh, rendering displaced geometry with V-Ray is very memory efficient. Uh, as long as uh, you have uh, like a 32-bit machine and you have those squares uh, very small, like I'm, I have them now, you'll be, uh, you have a very optimized way to render uh, displaced geometry. Once again, this is because V-Ray only generates the displaced geometry in the same squares that are being rendered right now. And then when it finishes rendering those, it uh, discards the geometry, so it frees up memory for the next, uh, for the next part. So if I stop this right now, I can show you a way you can make this even more interesting. Uh, you see that my displacement has an, this uh, multiplier of 0 0.1, which means that the brightest part of my texture, the complete white colors, are displaced uh, 0 0.1 units from the surface. And down here I have this uh, parameter which says water level. So I'm going to set this to 0 0.3. And I'm going to hit render and explain the result. Uh, what happens when I set this uh, value to 0 0.3 is that all the geometry which is below this uh, value of 0 0.3 is getting removed. And you can see that I can actually see through this uh, grid and it looks like this geometry is modeled even though it's not. Uh, which is a very cool thing because it will allow me to add these small details to my scene uh, and to my renderings without having to actually model this. Uh, if I had to model uh, this grid it would take me quite some time but uh, with just a simple texture in this um, water level parameter I'm able to create uh, quite uh, real and nice results and let me show you an actual rendering that we created so uh, if I bring the desktop uh, in here we have uh, this image which was uh, rendered from one of, for one of our uh, marketing materials so you can see that uh, this here is displaced geometry with the water level and really really uh, adds to the realism of my scene and to the just to the detail of the of the final rendering okay so this was the displaced geometry and uh, the final scene that I want to show you 
is a very heavy one, so it may take a couple of seconds to load it. Uh, one of the biggest issues uh, that you may have with Rhino is to uh, uh, render heavy geometry. So, for example, in Rhino uh, 4, where we only had a 32-bit version of V-Ray, uh, we tried to render just this part of my geometry, which is several uh, hundred thousand polygons, which is it's a very heavy uh, model, and we were not able to do this on a 32-bit machines machine. This is because uh, basically you need to stuff all this geometry in the memory, and uh, in order to be able to render it in a 32-bit machine, you're not able to do this. Uh, you can see that I have so much geometry that uh, actually the viewport is, my graphics card is having trouble uh, rotating the viewport. And uh, as a whole, if you want to render this, you'd need several gigabytes of memory and uh, you also need uh, to have 64-bit machine, obviously. So this would be very difficult. Uh, fortunately, uh, V-Ray was developed a long, long time ago when we only had 32-bit machines. So uh, what you can do is use one feature called the V-Ray Proxy. Uh, the very proxy is a very genius idea. What it allows you to do is um, to have your geometry and to export it on the hard drive. So you save all the complex geometry on your hard drive and you remove it from your scene and then on its place you just see a representation of this geometry. So later when you start rendering, um, when you start rendering what happens is uh, Vera is going to read from the hard drive and it's going to load in the memory only the small uh, parts that you need to render right now. The same way like uh, we do with the displaced geometry. So the way you export this is you select the geometry and then you have this proxy button here and uh, with the right, if you click the right mouse button you see the export uh, menu. So you can specify where you want the, the geometry to be saved and you also have a bunch of options if you want to have different uh, different parts of the geometry saved as different uh, uh, meshes. The cool thing is that you can actually specify how many faces you want to see in the preview and then you click OK. Uh, I'm not going to do this because these are many polygons and it will take some time. Instead I'm going to delete this geometry and uh, import the proxy. So with the left mouse button I can uh, very quickly import the proxy, just find it, click open, click enter and uh, in a second I'll see the geometry. Now something that is very uh, important when you want to export a proxy, if you want to have one proxy with different materials on top of it, you need to make sure that you assign those materials beforehand, before you export it. Because otherwise if I just apply one material to the proxy, I cannot specify different parts to have different materials. And when you have this, what happens is uh, uh, once you import the proxy back, Vira is going to assign these placeholder materials that you can later exchange, uh, which is the way you would share the proxy. And you can see I'm rendering this right now very uh, pretty quickly. This is uh, once again because Vira is only loading these parts of the geometry that are inside the small buckets. Now, uh, I just want to show you how memory efficient this is and I'm going to finish the presentation. So I'm going to stop this and uh, make some copies of, the, of this proxy. Okay, let's hit render and uh, while we're doing this I just want to see how much memory Rhino is using right now. So right now Rhino is using 1.3 gigabytes of memory to render all those 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 proxies which is pretty memory efficient and uh, as a whole you have a control that actually you can specify and limit the memory usage of Rhino so that you can make sure uh, that Rhino never uh, crashes. Okay, so I'm going to leave this uh, to render and uh, this pretty much concludes everything I had to show you. Um, once again, I want to thank you for inviting us and uh, for uh, any questions that you may have, uh, you can contact our uh, representative there, our partner there, Mr. Fu Zen from Zen Limited. Thank you. Bye-bye.